Thanks very much. So a couple of years ago, I was introduced to cell-based meat. This is meat made from stem cells using cell culture techniques. You might have also heard it being referred to as clean meat, cultivated meat, or even uh, cultured meat. The way that we create it is we take a part of an animal, so part of the cells of an animal, and then we expand this population of cells and guide them to become certain types of tissues. So in the case of meat, we're trying to make muscle and fat. We can use these technologies to create something like burgers, chicken nuggets, bacon, those types of things. And we can do all of this without killing or harming a single animal. So this isn't actually a new idea. Churchill came up with this, at, well, he didn't actually come up with it, sorry about that, but he did mention it in a paper in 1931. And in this paper, he talks about what, would the, what would the future would be like and how we would not ever need to use animals in our food ever again. But we haven't been able to do this since then, and the only reason we can do this now is because the advances in regenerative medicine have produced uh, new advances in the research of stem cells and tissue engineering. And this means that now we have the tools that we need to be able to produce cell-based meat. Regenerative medicine's been considered the future of medicine. It involves replacing or regenerating tissues to heal people. Cell-based meat, or cultivated meat, is, it takes the techniques from regenerative medicine and uses them to develop meat. Initially, I became a stem cell scientist because I was fascinated by this potential of regenerative medicine. I had never thought that we'd be able to use these techniques to develop meat. But since I've been working on this, and since our team and our collaborators have started to develop the technologies that we need to be able to commercialize cell-based meat, I started to wonder, how are these technologies that we're developing now going to affect regenerative medicine? Are they going to enable us to be able to bring regenerative medicine to the masses in the future? But first I want to talk about why we're going to so much trouble to make meat from stem cells. So by 2050, we're going to need to have to double our meat production. This means that we need to uh, maximize our efficiency, and we've already come up with a number of strategies to do this. So for example, we use antibiotics, and we treat our animals with these antibiotics to promote growth and make sure that we, we don't lose any animals to disease. This sounds like a great idea, but unfortunately, it's one of the major uh, contributors to antibacterial resistant diseases. The World Health Organization has also warned us that if we don't sort out this problem and remove this from our food chain, by the year 2050, we're going to have more people dying from antibiotic resistant disease than from cancer. Um, additionally, there are some countries uh, in which you have 80% of antibiotics in total being used, being used in animal agriculture. And of these, 70% of them are medically important, so we need them to treat disease. The other thing that we do to maximize our efficiency and make sure that we can produce enough meat is factory farming. So in Europe, 72% of our meat is produced in this way. It's a great idea for efficiency, but unfortunately, animal welfare issues are usually a problem. The animals are kept in really cramped conditions, which means that there's uh, an increased risk for spread of disease and also increased risk for foodborne diseases. On top of this, animal agriculture is actually really bad for our environment. Um, so a third, uh, it's estimated that a third of greenhouse gases are produced through farming. And if we want to increase our meat production, it means that we also need to increase our land use and our water use. And these are already under threat. So um, it's probably no shocker to any of you that there are tons of advocates out there trying to push governments to change legislation to support the causes of animal welfare, of our environment, and of our health. And the governments are working together to be able to do this, and they're trying to come up with new solutions. Cell-based meat could be a solution to this. We can produce meat without using any antibiotics, without, uh, without killing any animals, and we can do it alongside clever engineering solutions in a way that creates a circular energy system. So we're doing away with the make, use, dispose models. So I just want to talk about another time in history when development of one technology 
led to uh, it being adapted for the use of another technology and then that technology actually making uh, the first technology become realized. This was also an example of where an existential threat resulted in the development of new technology. We can compare this to cell-based meat because right now we have existential threats that are threatening our planet. So for example, these are the ones that I've just discussed, our health, our environment, etc. So the space, so the space programs of today had humble beginnings. They, they were the greatest minds of the, of the day, struggled to make their ideas a reality, and their rockets couldn't reach more than one kilometer in altitude. But that was until these types of technologies were adapted and used to develop military weapons. So after that, after the Second World War, just for example, the German V2 could reach altitudes of 200 kilometers. And then continuing on, the Soviet Union and the United States fiercely competed to be able to develop weapons technology, which led to the space race. And through that space race, we ended up with the first artificial satellite, we ended up with a man on the moon, and we ended up with space stations being in space. So without this existential threat, would we have still been in the same place with rocket technology, or would it have just progressed more slowly? We don't know. So, regenerative medicine has given us the ability to create different tissues using stem cell technology. Um, but this is a construct of heart muscle tissue. Um, so the researchers here are from the University Medical Center of Hamburg Effendorf, and they've developed a biomaterial and they've used stem cells and guided those stem cells from a patient to become heart muscle tissue. Because these stem cells are able to mature within the biomaterial, which is a material that we use to be able to support the cells growth and help the tissues mature, they've been able to link up together, become electrically active, and then create a beating heart muscle tissue. So these are the types of technologies that we've taken and then adapted to develop cell-based meat. So this is, um, is an image now of uh, pig stem cells that have been um, uh, directed to become skeletal muscle cells. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit more about the process of how we do this on an industry scale. So first, for in our company, we take uh, a sample of cells from the animal. So this could be anything. It could be blood, or it could be uh, from when the animal gets its ear clipped, when it's being tagged. And we take these cells, and we use a, a, a technique called reprogramming to take them back in time so that they're equivalent to an embryonic stem cell. We call these cells induced pluripotent stem cells, and they can expand uh, almost indefinitely so that we can create a huge bank of stem cells from them. And these are all identical. From there, we can use this cell bank as a source of cells to expand cells within a bioreactor system. Once we've expanded the cells, we can use different uh, techniques to guide the cells through a process called differentiation to become those tissues that we need. And we do that within biomaterials. So the cells need to eat every single day, just like you and me do. We need to provide the cells with uh, a liquid called media. And that media has everything that the cells need to survive. So, for example, proteins and sugars and those types of things. We also use a bioreactor system to make sure that we can protect the cells from the outside environment, since they're not within a body, and also so that we can um, make sure that we have control of the environment within the system to maximize growth. So we can already make all of the tissues that we need to make cell-based meat. We can make muscle, we can make fat. So why is it that you can't eat it today at lunch? And the reason is because cell-based meat has a number of unique challenges. What we're trying to do is we're trying to produce um, products that are very, very low margin products at very high volumes. And stem cell research and, stem, and growing stem cells in general is very expensive. And just to give you an idea of this, when we made our first cultivated burger, or when Mark Post made the first cultivated burger, it cost $300,000. Yeah, so this is completely outside of my budget. And uh, yeah, so, so today, uh, we, the cell-based meat companies that are working on these technologies have progressed, and we're able to produce meat now at 100 times less than that, but this is still far too expensive for the average person to eat. So that's challenge number one. The second challenge is if we want to have a big impact and if we want to be able to reach people and create sustainable companies, we're going to need to produce millions of kilograms of this meat. 
This is a real challenge because we can't use scientists within uh, labs to create the meat. It would take far too long, it would be far too expensive, and we wouldn't have any control over the process. So that's a problem there. We also need to be able to create meat within biomaterials if we want to create those complex structures of meat that really represent the products that we're used to seeing. But the problem is we need to have these biomaterials either be edible and not cause any problems to anyone's digestion, for example, or we need them to be biodegradable to the point where we can degrade them before the product's even made. This is a real challenge. So what are cell-based meat companies doing to overcome these problems? We're innovating, of course. So um, just as I mentioned, the cells need to grow in media. And they also produce waste every single day, which means that we need to replace this media every single day. We're adapting new technologies and older technologies from other fields to be able to create systems for media recycling. So these systems remove the waste from the media and keep the cells healthy. We're also using other techniques as well. Um, and one idea, one idea for circular um, energy systems, for example, is to take these waste products that are being produced through media recycling, for example, ammonia, and then use, for example, nitrifying bacteria to produce nitrogen from that waste. Then we can use that as fertilizer. Another area that we're innovating in is trying to understand what are the best biomaterials for us to use. So there are some companies that have gone down the synthetic biomaterial route and some that have gone down the uh, natural biomaterial route. And we're talk when we're talking about natural biomaterials, these could be those that are made from anything like soy, from algae, and even from mushrooms. So there's a lot of work being done in this area. But when we're looking at synthetic biomaterials, some really exciting work is being done here too. And we've already found that we can produce synthetic biomaterials that are reproducible cheaply and sustainably, and that these are compatible with eating food as well. There are some really interesting innovations going on in this area. So for example, we have, skeletal mus we have uh, biomaterials that imitate skeletal muscle tissue. So we can change the temperature or we can pass electrical currents through these and they'll contract and relax just like a muscle does. And this is great for our cells because it means we can produce even more mature muscle tissue. We also need to make sure that we have a fully automated bioreactor system. So the focus here is making sure that it's close to the outside environment and that we limit human interaction with it as much as possible. The reason for this is this allows us to remove antibiotics from the system. Uh, and it also allows us to cut down on the manpower needed on a day-to-day -day basis to run the system. Um, the other thing that we're also doing is we're adapting technologies that are used in the pharmaceutical industry. So these are technologies uh, for tracking the environment within the bioreactor to make sure you have the right uh, material environment in there. We're taking these and we're improving on these to make them adaptable to stem cells and stem cell specific processes. And by doing this, we don't need to have scientists on board all the time testing uh, what's happening within the production system. Developing this type of system will also prevent uh, batch loss and those types of things because I, as many of you might know, stem cells are quite unpredictable and they need to be in perfect conditions. Um, so this is really important for us. Batch loss would be devastating cost-wise to a cell-based meat company. So how could this influence regenerative medicine? So regenerative medicines, many of them are focused on developing patient-specific um, therapies. So you take a patient's own cells, you develop the therapy, and then you introduce them back into the patient. But many of these therapies can actually be adapted so that you only need a handful of patients or a certain set number of patients, and then these uh, therapies developed from those patients can be used in a lot of other patients. One of the examples of this that all of you will know of already is blood transfusions. We know that if you have a certain blood type, uh, you're able to uh, donate that blood to somebody else who needs it. And this is an example. Right now, we can produce blood from induced pluripotent stem cells. We have the protocols to be able to do this. But why couldn't we do it right now? The answer is because it would take us three weeks, to, approximately, to produce blood from induced pluripotent stem cells. That's three weeks of replacing the media every single day. And when you think of the blood, uh, the blood need for America and Canada for one year, it's two million gallons. So can you imagine changing media to grow that much blood? 
It would be incredibly expensive and it's just not feasible. But if we take the technologies that we're developing in cultured meat uh, and cell-based meat, if we take those technologies and we apply them to regenerative medicine so that when regenerative medicine is at the stage when these uh, therapies are ready, we're ready as well and we have the technologies that they need to be able to uh, maximize their therapies to reach everyone, we would be able to produce these therapies very cheaply which would mean that these therapies would not just be uh, for the very rich or the very fortunate, they'd be for everyone. I think regenerative medicine is the future, but if we don't take action to make sure that these are cheaper too, we're not going to be able to do this. So just as the space race uh, and war influenced the space race so that we could achieve rocket technology, it could be that by solving our problems and by trying to address these global problems, we're able to actually um, bring regenerative medicine into a new era. Thank you.